Yes, aha, I see you, Mara. Yes, so this is, in fact, the way of looking at it, is, is that these various stages that are specified in the 16 stages of insight can happen in, in very quick succession, even for the beginner, so that we take on that disgust with those unwholesome thoughts, because we can see that they're unwholesome, mm. and therefore take on the immediately the desire to escape from that, and then the determination to do that, and then the next one is popping out of it. And that whole process can be done with that one statement, aha, I see you, Myra. Mm -hmm. Another way of looking at it is, is that when the mind is clinging to an unwholesome object, and we're tightly grasping a hold of it, when we begin to see that, then what will kind of happen is, that many begin to try to become free from it, and yet they're holding to it while they're trying, and so there's a struggle. Someday I will be free from this. Mm. That's because they don't really see the dukkha yet. It's like they've been told about the dukkha, they've been warned of it, but they haven't really seen it yet. Mm. They've even warned it, they've even seen enough of it that they're warning themselves and yet they're still clinging because the desire is still stronger than their uh, ability to see the unwholesome. But once we do see the unwholesome, once that threshold, once that teeter totter goes from one side to the next, then pop, and this <laughs> happens. Aha, I see you, Mara. Hmm. We pop right out of it, and by doing that, we separate ourselves from it. Because, see, before, that thought was my thought. This is me. Mm -hmm. you identify and there, too and strongly we, with it. And we identify with it, and we take delight in it, and we don't see the danger and the disgust in it. So this is what the Mahasi is doing. He's inviting us, if you see that stuff, but see it quickly. You don't have to peddle with that stuff for 30 years before you wake up to the fact, hey, wait a minute, this is the dukkha. <laughs> <laughs> we can begin to see that from the very beginning of the practice. To wake up, see that stuff is dukkha, and we can, aha, I see you. And so we begin to practice Anapanasati correctly in the sense of every now unwholesome thought is steered back into the wholesome. And every <clears throat> thought then is going to be of gladdening the mind, brightening the mind, making this a wonderful moment. Everything is fine. No problems. No worries made. Everything is so cool. <laughs> Got no worries. No problems. Got nothing to do and no place to go. And wow, isn't it nice? Mm -hmm. Just to relax. What a wonderful afternoon. Rain and all. <laughs> <laughs> And so these are wholesome thoughts. Yeah. When we have those kind of wholesome thoughts, we begin to fall into the feeling of those wholesome thoughts. We actually begin to take our word for it, that things really are okay. Whoa, that sounds amazing. <laughs> <laughs> well, we have been talking ourselves into feeling bad our whole lives. Now it's time to talk ourselves into feeling good. Mm. And this is a major part of the teaching of the Buddha, is to stop with all of the critical thinking, and this is good, and this is bad, and judgments, and unwholesome thought, and come back into nurturing thought. This is nice. Everything's fine. Yeah. Wow, I like this. Wow. Oh, it's, uh, no more work to do. Everything <laughs> done. <laughs> Got mm. a handle on this. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I think I've over the past few days I have come to realize that oh, I've been caught up in all un unwholesomeness, but I've come to realize that after maybe a couple hours of being in the unwholesome and being restless and tense and whatnot, but then I realize, and I am, I do say to myself, aha, I see you, Mara. I <laughs> say that to myself in my head, and um, <laughs> uh, and that does, that does very much help, but 
Taking yeah. that deep breath along with it helps greatly also. Taking that uh, breath and say, ah, oh, oh, I saw that. Don't have to think <laughs> about that anymore. Here we can say, I've been worried for 30 minutes. But that's the wrong attitude. The mm. wrong attitude is, oh, I, look how much I've suffered for 30 minutes. It's just more suffering. Yeah, 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 yeah. But brightening the mind is, aha, I caught you. I see that. <laughs> Wakey, wakey, I got you. <laughs> <laughs> kind of like a game. Kind of like it a just, game. Please, that's the whole point. Let it be. Nothing is serious, really. Stop. Games are fun. <laughs> fun. Ga- games are fun, yeah. Fun. Let your life be joyful. Mm. Your life was joyful when you were a little kid, and then they came in with all this criticism and work to do, and you said, yes, sir. And you've been saying yes, sir, to that same set of rules your whole life. And you stop playing. Time to play. And this time, guess what? We have such a magnificent, marvelous toy to play with. The human being. Mm. And you've got your very own human being to play with <laughs> and, to, to, and to enjoy to your heart's delight. <laughs> yes. I have my own human being to play with 24-7. Three six oh. five. Now a lot of people will think that 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 I'm advertising hedonism, but oh no, no that you, we have to see the danger. Mm. That's the whole point. We have to play safely. We have to play wisely. Mm. Okay, that's the way that we play it, with skill. And so mm. uh, instead of making a bunch of noise, we wind up making beautiful music. Right, yeah, yeah, yeah. It yeah. can't be random, chaotic, and stuff. It's got there to, be, to noble. be It's got yeah. to be high quality, first class. Everything is lined up in order. The mind is now fit for work and organized. Mm. That we're up to scratch. That's where that real confidence comes from. The real confidence is actually because we know we can do it. We can handle this. Mm. I can live my life quite well, thank you very much. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, the confidence but, is but, very important. Yes. And it is so important the Buddha put it on the Eightfold Noble Path. He knew what he was talking He's about. Talking about. <laughs> <laughs> yep. That's part of the uh, uh, the growth in the Dhamma is to appreciate how spot on the Buddha was about this stuff, that it actually works. Just the way that he said it did. Just pure bullseyes every single time. Mm-hmm. That's so amazing. And so we apply this Eightfold Noble Path to develop this very, uh, the Pali word is Sama Sankapa, right noble attitude, which is actually translated often as right noble thought. But we're not talking about a, an individual thought that lasts a tenth of a second. We're talking mm-hmm. about a noble thought process or a noble view uh, but we've already got the word view for uh, a much more no uh, momentary thing okay mm-hmm. uh, and so the, the Sama Sankapa is actually developed as a skill and the Buddha actually talks about that in the sense that that's added later but in the beginning it's right uh, view to see what is right and what is wrong, to sati, to wake up and, and check that out. And the third one is the right effort to make things that uh, make your view more correct. Mm-hmm. And to make your thoughts more correct, because uh, this is the, the beginning practice. And that's exactly what we do in Anapanasati. That's the actual gladdening of the mind is one's right effort. Mm. Okay, but then that fourth ingredient is added, and that is right to noble attitude, which then is added to the mix later. And that right noble attitude be- winds up being, I can do this, that I can, in fact, add this fourth ingredient and get real success out of it, that I can keep doing this over and over again. And so what this means is, is this process is the actually talking to ourselves into feeling good by talking mm-hmm. good and to now 
the right noble attitude is we begin to feel really successful, really secure, really safe. We take it on. Like dominoes. You're mm-hmm. successful with each thing, and then the exactly. next bit of success will fall naturally. Exactly. And so now we're really developing the jhana factors. This is how it's done. Oh, the jhanas. I've the jhana heard jhana. of the jhanas. jhanas. <laughs> Heard of, haven't done much research or reading into them because I know that that is far beyond my scope. No, we just discussed uh, three fifths of the whole show. In fact, four fifths. We've already, we're almost got the jhana factors together before I start talking about what these things are that we're getting. Uh... Okay, the biggest, biggest number one is unwholesome thoughts are kaput. Mm-hmm. That's the number one. Those are the hindrances of the mind. Number two, we start talking ourselves into feeling good means that now we're applying the mind to the wholesome and sustaining it by keeping the thoughts wholesome. Sustain, yeah. Sustained thought. Now we're kicking in with the right attitude and we begin to feel the results of this, the sukha, which is the feeling of success. No, actually, excuse me, let me back up. A wrong choice of words here, and uh, mm. I'll show you that one in a moment. And that is the feeling of uh, security, the feeling of safety, that we no longer feel anxiety. A lot of meditators say, hey, when I start to meditate, I feel anxiety. The answer, that's really great. I'm glad you can see it. Take a deep breath and become friends with it, because it's really not all of that bad anyway. And so it kind of melts away. So we get to the state of, I can get rid of it. I can do this. And then we begin to feel really secure, really safe, really comfortable, and confidence begins to grow. So we can actually talk about sukha as the exact opposite of dukkha. And here it is as an item on the list of Anapanasati skills to be developed. And there it is, is one of the five items of the first jhana, Mm -hmm. as well as in many, many other places. Mm -hmm. Yeah, Yeah. That, that, that notion of making friends of it is very, very important. The moment that you make friends with something that you're not comfortable with, Mm -hmm. the uncomfortableness goes away. So right. you've got nothing to be uncomfortable about. So right. you know makes... it's all fine and dandy. <laughs> exactly so. And yet somehow or another we the whole human race has gotten upside down by making things important with jobs to do. Mm. This is better than that, rather than uh everything is okay. The making of friends with it thing is definitely something that I think I need to work on. I I I do have and have had. Don't work very... at it. Play with it. You've got play a new... with it. Play with it. Yeah. You've got a new friend. Play with it. <laughs> Poor choice of words. Poor choice of words. I do apologize. But, um, well, it's something play I need with to play with. Is wholesome. Yeah. A problem to work on, that sounds like dukkha. <laughs> a new friend to play with, that's wholesome. That's the way of approaching a whole existence. Everything's okay. Everything's yeah. fine. Yeah, yeah, All yeah. these new toys to play with. And that is, in fact, the root of, then of that is the attitude. That's a winner's attitude, is that attitude of everything's a friend to play with, rather yeah. than, oh, no, this is a lot of work. This is a problem to work on. This is... I'm, not e- I'm not even experiencing <clears throat> it, and I've just labeled it as something, as a problem, and I'm not mm-hmm. even dealing with it. Okay. But that's our normal attitude of a victim. That's victimhood. Yeah. And so we need to change that frame of reference. Mm. Our worldview. <clears throat> and do we do it step by step through this practice and getting successful so that we begin to... You could say, in fact, that the stepping stones is one aha after another. Mm. And in that case, aha, I see you, Mara, is one of those kind of stepping stones. 
But aha, I get the point now. I've got nothing to do. <laughs> it's another kind of those stepping stones. So it's kind of like the insight practice is just one glorious aha after another once we get all of the unwholesome thoughts out of the way. Mm. Because if we are practicing with the hindrances still there, then what have we got to note now? And where is that going to take us? <sighs> okay, so this is why the Buddha talks about the first step. The really first step is, is to clean up the mind, to purify the mind, to make the mind wholesome. And mm. he talks about that in all cases. There's whole sutras about it. It's also spoken specifically as one's right effort in the Eightfold Noble Path. And so I don't know why all of the modern meditation techniques talk, start the students off to do something when the mind is still uh, polluted with hindrances. Yeah, 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 yeah. You're just, you're, you're not getting to the root of the problem. You're just saying, do this, do this, do this. But you're not, Context is important. Context and understanding is important. The 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 reason behind a methodology, you know, mm -hmm. but you're just dropping them in like, there you go, have fun, uh -huh. <laughs> De deal with it. And you're just like, what am I dealing with? I know I've got to sit here and notice the breath, but like, what, what? So yeah, it, mm -hmm. it, it. I know we've spoken about it before, but it still does baffle me how they just left out all of the, the juicy stuff, all the really, really good, helpful, juicy base stuff uh, in the West, which is, as you've described, very, very much integral and important mm -hmm. for the practice as a whole. Well, um, I would say that in the West that there are two major issues mm -hmm. and that one of the issues should not have been here because Mahasi got it right. Mm. Mahasi got it right, Bhikkhu Buddha Dasa got it right, it's, it, both of them agree with the suttas, and yet no one in the West does it. Do you know what I'm talking about? I'm talking about the breath and how we relate to the breath, because yeah. all the Western techniques have to say is, is just watch the breath. Mm. Note the breath, watch the in and out, watch the rise and fall, yeah. And Mahasi himself says that you have to seize the object. You have to jump on it, to fall on it, to seize it, to uh, confront it. And that's exactly what Bhikkhu Buddha Dasa says at length in his books on Anapanasati. Mm -hmm. And that's exactly the instructions in the Anapanasati Sutta of all things. <laughs> that is, mindfully take that long, deep in-breath and mindfully take that long, deep out breath. This is the practice. Okay? That deep means it's breath. got to control the breathing. You can't yeah. just watch it. With the whole quality is, is that if you can control the breath and continue to control the breath and continue to watch it control the breath, <laughs> then you're beginning to gain some control and mastery over your own mind as well as over the breath. And yeah. if you can learn to control your own mind, you can also learn to control your feelings. And in fact, we've just talked about how that's done. We talk ourselves into feeling good. We, we, we sit ourselves down and comfort ourselves and, let, and reassure ourselves. And then pretty soon that old child inside just, oh, I feel so good. <laughs> <laughs> but then people in the West are just so uh, capable of talking themselves into feeling bad as well, which is, you know, comes then back to criticism, critical thinking and... Being overly self-critical. And all my meditation sort of isn't good enough. Yeah, 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 yeah. That as well. <laughs> yes, that's it. All my meditation isn't good enough. Oh, please help me. <laughs> 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 yeah. And so, and so that means that they haven't even reached the first level of doubt. Mm. Okay, the first level of doubt is I've got such a mess here that I can't clean it up. I need help. Where can I find help? Let me go find some help. 
let me go get a teacher. Let me go get a, um, uh, a professor. Let me go find a doctor. Let me go find a therapist or a guru or um, a dentist. Anyone, please. <laughs> <No>. <laughs> Got a pretty big ache here and I need it pulled out. Yeah, 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 yeah. Oh, wait a minute, Jesus. <laughs> no, Jesus. And so you have all of these promises from all of these places and all of these people are already built into being a victim, which means they're the loser who cannot do it themselves or no longer, they don't have the, the get-go of the attitude of a lion at all. Mm. They're already stuck in the victim, so their doubt is a victim's viewpoint. Okay, the victim's mm -hmm. viewpoint is who on the outside can I get to fix the inside because the inside is too broken to fix itself. Mm. Hopefully that person gets to run across the second noble truth where it begins to get pounded into them that the cause of all of your suffering is invented in-house and the only way to clean it up is in-house. That's what the second noble truth really, really brings home, that all destruction is from within. Yeah. Everything rots from within in the sense of ignorance, that we want things that we don't have. If I didn't want anything, I was whole. If I see something I like and then I want it, now I want something I don't have, which now I have just created a big hole in myself that needs to be filled by whatever it was that I want. And when I get that thing and try to plug that hole, plug it into the hole that I've created in myself to fit it, don't quite fit. <laughs> don't quite fit, and then you're unsatisfied. Right, right with what we bought. Yeah. Buyer's remorse in the fact that what we buy not only has a mortgage, but it gets old faster than the mortgage does. <laughs> <laughs> and so all we wind up with is just more dukkha. Mm. When our intention, original intention was to get rid of the dukkha. Yeah. And we wind up with even more. And, and the more we have, the more normal we are in our society. So that every individual is just not particularly happy. But they have to pretend to be because the society expects it. Yeah. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. Society expects it. Mm -hmm. But then so many people are just suffering in silence and not doing not doing a damn thing about it to try and rectify it. The, uh, the, the, the thought of Henry David Thoreau comes uh, in his book of Walden. He says, uh, people live lives of quiet desperation. Ah, I like that. Mm -hmm. We live lives of quiet desperation, which means that we try to keep all the junk inside if we can but we're still desperate because we don't believe that we can fix our own problems. So the second noble truth actually is a promise, finally, that there mm. is a solution by recognizing that there's a cause to the problem. Once we understand the cause, we can start working on that cause so for the solution to go away. In fact, the Buddha was very big on the whole idea of cause and effect. Mm. And he talks about that every fire has a fuel. What fire does not have a fuel is the right question to ask because people start thinking about it. There's no fire without a fuel. Everything has to have a cause. And when yes. that cause is removed, then the likelihood of that effect is to dwindle away. Very true. That is so well insightful. That's almost the, the entire teaching of the Buddha, which because inside of that, we can say that, yeah, I arose. That means I'm going to pass away also. Mm -hmm. There's nothing permanent here, folks. Goodbye. I'm out of here. Goodbye. <laughs> I'm back. <laughs> no, it's not, oh, it's not the same dude. <laughs> Yeah. That everything is temporary and everything passes away and everything is new again. And so this is the way that we begin to see things. In fact, this is why that is part of the Anapanasati Sutra. We're talking about step 13. Mm. 
14 and 15 here, which is to see a Nietzsche, see everything is transitory. Everything is actually in a state of rot. And everything that comes to be dies. Okay, and that when we pay very, very close attention to things, when we're talking about paying close attention, this is again taking or seizing the object. And so I'll take a little bit a uh, moment here. This is a good example of what we mean by it. The distinction between playing a, a video game mm -hmm. and watching someone else play the game. If And a lot of people who practice meditation think that all they have to do is just watch the show. But in this practice of Anapanasati on the inside, we've got to actually become the player. We've got to have some skin in the game, so to speak. Mm -hmm. That means that we have to seize the object. So we have to seize the breath. Mm -hmm. We have to seize the mind. And so we have to seize um, the object even when we're talking about watching the arising and the passing away, that we have to seize it in the sense of actually seek it out, grab hold of it, and note that everything's in turmoil. Mm. And then also go out and seize the fact that everything is rotting away, everything is falling apart, and that much of what human misery is all about is that the human doesn't like loss. We don't like it. And yet that's the way of everything. Everything rots and falls apart, giving us nothing but the end of the show of Anapanasati step 16 is now the relinquishment, the letting go. And that too is an active thing to do. Mm -hmm. it, it, it takes skin in the game. Even if you get the whole game played down to now, all you have to do is one more card to move. You still have to move that one card to set yeah. it up. So all the cards go blah, 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 blah. Okay. So you still have to actually actively throw it out to let it go. Now, this is not something that's done as a, uh, at a one-time shot in a great, great big way with star-spangled banners or star-spangled uh, uh, lightning and all of that. <laughs> but rather, this is the things that happen in the moment over and over and over again, is to see things just rotting away, see things uh, uh, dying out, and to see things as throwing it out, like throwing out the trash, mm -hmm. dumping it. There it goes, out it goes. And then we begin to see everything that it really is, is the fact that everything is transitory. Everything is in flux. We begin to see the flux quality to it because we're not holding to the death of anything because there's so much dying. I mean, when you have one old man and the whole town dies, then you can have a great big funeral. But what happens when you have a plague and 30% of the people in the village are dead? You're going to have that many elaborate funerals? Oh, no, you're going to find a big hole and dump them all in it. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, ain't got time okay. for 30 elaborate, lavish and funerals. Exactly. So we don't have to have elaborate funerals and memories and celebrations for our own past because it's so fleeing anyway, is mm -hmm. just to throw it out, to let the past go, to dump true, it. True, true. Bye. True. Bye, bye. Yeah, out you go. <laughs> and this is exactly the same way that we treat with the uh, I see you, Myra, because we recognize that all of this stuff is the same unwholesome pile of garbage. Mm -hmm. But now we're it watching it ha as it happens. We're watching the past in its own formation. Mm. But in fact, point. we begin to understand that everything that we see has already happened, is already dead by the time that we understand what it was, it's dead. <laughs> it's like everything we do is an autopsy. <laughs> 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 everything we see and do is an instantaneous autopsy. As soon as we start uh, cutting it open, it's dead already. Mm, yeah. And so we begin to see that, and that's an, e that's an easy way to let it go. It's so easy now to just let, let everything go and let it just swim on by. 
This is actually what is meant by the stream entry. Mm. But there's more to it that, uh, that we need to go into. And that is, is that we've talked about one kind of doubt. Mm-hmm. And that's the doubt that we don't uh, think we can do it ourselves. And so we're looking for outside help. And then we run across the second noble truth and we say, wait a minute, I, 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 nobody's going to be able to help me. If I'm going to get any help, I'm going to have to do it myself. Yeah. Wow, what a mountain, what a wall of doubt there is for that, because that's the reason why a lot of people do find themselves in meditation is because they've already gone through the therapy route or the uh, whipping themselves with chains and other things. <laughs> you would be surprised at what people go through before they actually try to clean out their own mind. Yeah. They try all sorts of different avenues, all and sorts so, of different methods. When... When we get going, then, with the, with the practice, um, we begin to understand that there's this, there's this one thing that needs to be done, and that is just to go from the unwholesome into the wholesome. That's, again, the main thing to do. And those yeah. are the, all about the skills to be developed, and that we have to do that with gusto. With gusto, we have yeah. to seize that thing and, yeah. and 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 make it change. It's like if you're the pilot of the ship and you see the, 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 you're heading the ship right towards the dock. <laughs> <laughs> you got to turn that wheel, boy. That's you got to change gotta, course. Change you course proactively. Mm-hmm. Exactly. That's how we look at it: is to be able to see where we're headed and be able to make the change, and we have to take the effort to do that. And so we begin to practice that. That's what the practice of Anapanasati is, to start to develop these skills that wind up being a wisdom eye so that we can actually see how things are, uh, are headed because we're watching. We can see. We wake up. We re-navigate. We change course back into the wholesome over and over and over again until we get really good at it. Mm-hmm. Once we get very good at that, then we begin to build confidence to the point that now we can say, I can clean my mind out without a doubt. Mm, Without a doubt. Without a doubt, I can, in fact, clean out my mind. I know I can do it. Mm. The Buddha then says that this is, in fact, the first knowledge of the noble path. This is the first step, is the knowledge that no matter what, I can clean out my mind. No matter how much junk I get stuck into, I can clean it out. Mm -hmm. This is a knowledge that is noble. It is super mundane. (laughs) It is a factor of a path, of the path, and it is not held by ordinary people. You can see, in fact, that it's not held by ordinary people. Most people still have doubts about are they up to the task or not. This is the recognition, yes, I am, I'm up to the task. Another way of saying it is I now begin to see what the path is. Mm -hmm. Okay, but the first thought is, is am I up to it? It's almost like that now I decided I'm going to climb that mountain and I can do it. I may not know the path to get up there, but when it's time, I'll find that path. But right now, I'm packing my bags and my gear and my tent and my shovels (laughs) and I'm on the way. Okay, this is that level. Okay, is that we've got the confidence, some degree of determination, the term determination of this stage of to be able to purify the mind. This is it. Can you purify your mind? Can you get the mind into wholesome thoughts Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. and to get out the unwholesome thoughts? And I find that so remarkable that the Buddha actually states it that way, that this is the first knowledge. This is the step on the path. This is the first stage that's noble. This is, in fact, one who does this and comes to that point is, by the Buddha's definition, a sotapan. He's on the path because he knows that he can clean out his own mind and be completely free from unwholesome thoughts. Mm-hmm. And yet, you don't see anyone in the West in meditation circles here and there even practicing this. 
So where's your soda pop? Dunno. <laughs> so this is the way of looking at it now is is that this is why these hindrances and removing the hindrances is so powerful and important yeah. is because actually it's part of the eradication of the doubt and giving us that confidence that comes in that fourth item on the Eightfold Noble Path, that right attitude. Here is right attitude when it's all polished up and shiny. I can do this. Mm. Mm -hmm. I mean, I think I've had little instances of which I've had, you know, extreme confidence and determination in my abilities where I've steered myself away from feeling, you know, particularly crappy. <laughs> um, and after that... And you know now that you don't have to feel crappy anymore, that you could pull yourself out of crappy. Exactly, exactly. Isn't that marvelous feeling, though, to that yeah. knowledge that you don't have to feel crappy anymore, <laughs> that you can figure it out when you get crappy <laughs> and pull yourself out of it. That not that marvelous? It felt amazing <laughs> <laughs> to pull myself out of crappy and to then sit there and be like, Yo, <laughs> I did that. Yo, let's go. Um, yeah, a very, yes. very, very, very accomplished good feeling. Mm -hmm. That's why the Buddha labels that as part of Anapanasati is that powerful feeling of I've got this. Mm. In, in the Pali is called pity or pity. more correctly, pity sukha. Pity sukha. Mm. Piti sukha is almost always together. Piti um, is used alone in the sense of euphoria. Mm, mm -hmm, mm -hmm. Okay, and sukha alone is used as the opposite of dukkha in the sense of well-being and sabai. You yeah. put piti and sukha together, and you get a range of feelings that have that feeling of. Maybe not euphoria, but it's solid confidence that I can do this. Yeah. Yeah, 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 yeah. It's kind of like the feeling that the guy, after he's climbed Mount Everest, when he's on the top of Mount Everest, that's the euphoria. Yeah. But he's got to sleep that night. <laughs> 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 and so he's not going to stay on top of the mountain. In fact, they have to schedule it so that they're up there very early in the morning so they can get their butt off of it before sundown. <laughs> yeah. Yeah, 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 yeah. They've got to be careful. <laughs> okay, so to sleep tonight, we have to get off the, the euphoria, but still that feeling of satisfaction is there. Yeah. Did it. Got it done. Job well done. On the way down now. And so the downhill journey, in fact, is quite uh, satisfying. Mm, mm. And is also headed towards safety. Yes, towards safety. Very good. Okay, point. and so then that, that's where we can see then the distinction between pity and sukha. You can also see it in, the, in regard of um, uh, New Year where they count the ball down, down to zero. And then what happens is every, the crowd goes literally wild. Yeah. <laughs> Horns honking, people yelling, screaming. <laughs> yeah, Fireworks. Oh, exactly, exactly, exactly. <laughs> but that only lasts for a short time, maybe one minute, maybe even 30 seconds. Yeah. And then they break out into all lang syne. Everybody hugs and sighs, and they rock back and forth. And that's now the sukha phase, the mm. piti sukha. You see how that stuff works yeah. together. Yeah, okay, yeah, yeah. this is things that we should begin to note, to begin to notice, to begin to develop. Mm. These are skills to be developed. And as we gather these skills, as well as being able to have wholesome thoughts one after another, those things together combine to make first jhana the whole. And as you understand, the whole is greater than the sum of the parts. When these five jhana factors come together, something new comes about. Mm -hmm. And that is what would be called the right organization of the mind. Now the mind is fit for work. 
Okay. Now okay. the mind is really fit for work. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. Okay. And so this is how we want to uh, think about the first jhana, is bringing all of these factors together to make the mind really fit for work. Mm. Because now we're going to do the inspections that need to be done from that scientific procedure. It's almost like the first jhana is building the lab. Now okay. the lab, And now that the lab is built, we can do real scientific experiments. Right, right. Okay, That's another way, way that, that the next way that I look at it is uh, like this is that imagine that it's like a violin that you need to play just one note on. <sighs> but, but you need the entire violin to do that. You need the neck and the curl and the wire and the bridge and the, uh, uh, the body of the uh, thing all put together, not, bo- not bashed into pieces and, <laughs> and sent off to the factory for repair. But <laughs> But a complete whole it needs to be violin. assembled, everything and, together uh, at the same time. Assembled. Everything is correctly assembled to make a high quality violin. And now we have just one wire, and that's the first jhana. The second, third, and fourth jhana is merely adding a new wire. Right. A whole lot of work is in that first jhana if you want to think of it as work. <laughs> yeah. Or, or the uh, one's right effort. Yeah, the right effort is is in, to in fact to get the mind into this wholesome state, one wholesome thought after the other. That's the construction of the violin. Mm. Yeah, you have to have that tuned body in order to get those vibrations going. And yeah. this is something that they don't quite understand. That the Buddha harped on and on about. If I could use a pun there, harping. <laughs> <laughs> We gotta, we gotta fiddle with this thing. <laughs> <I don't. sighs> so, <laughs> fiddle off. <laughs> <laughs> well, it's all wholesome. It's, it's, it's all... yeah, it's all very wholesome. It's all very, very wholesome, but. The more and more that you are able to cultivate these wholesome thoughts, does it, you know, over time becomes more autonomous, more automatic. The more and more that you cultivate again and again and again and again, actively cultivating the wholesome, and then it becomes more automatic, autonomous. Mm -hmm. Or it becomes a new habit. A habit, yeah. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Yeah, the old habit is just whatever comes up, that's okay. Mm. Now we're what's ever coming up. We got to pass a test. Is this okay or not? Mm. Do you get in or not? Mm. Okay. And when we start standing guard and start watching for these unwholesome thoughts and not allow them in, that's when things really begin to change. Yeah, that's. Mm. From what I've been taught from MBSR. Anything is okay. Anything. You just see it for what it is, just a thought or a feeling, and it's fine. It doesn't matter if it's unpleasant or whatever. But hmm? I know. I mean, yeah, yeah, yeah. You, you said we, that you used to. Right. We. Uh, not only that, but we can trace back to the time when that viewpoint. Got invaded into the teachings of the Buddha. This is back to the Vasudhimaka, which is different than the suttas. Mm. And so, by teaching out of the suttas and understanding the suttas, we find that this is what the Buddha taught: was grasping hold and beginning to control the objects. Then, one after the other, we make the objects whole or wholesome, and then we pursue only the wholesome. An example of this is is that in this pursuit, when we're in the first jhana and actually investigating Paticca Samapada, mm-hmm. in the sense of actually investigating our own consciousness and, un- and investigating our own perception. Like, what is this? How do I think this way? Why is this? You know, we start asking those questions and picking apart what the mind is doing. We do that right up into the feelings of what do I feel and why do I feel them and that kind of thing. But then in the first jhana, we do not reflect upon the higher stages of 
the uh, 12 parts of uh, Petitu Samapada. Not the grasping, not the clinging, not the being born into the woeful state of me or the suffering that occurs because I'm there. Why is that? Because we're already in the first John and everything we're doing by its very nature is all wholesome. Mm. Therefore, it's all wise at that point of contact, and therefore, it's all good feelings. All the feelings that we have, that whatever's left, is all pity and sukha. We don't have any liking and not liking kind of feelings. Yeah. And because in so in the first jhana, we're actually limited to limited to the kinds of things that we would want to note. Because by definition of being in first jhana, a lot of those things to note are not going to be there. Yeah. And yet, in the uh, mindfulness-based stress reduction, they tell you to note all of that garbage. Because guess what? You still got it. You didn't get rid of it. <laughs> yeah, that's, that's literally it. You're just noting it. You're not. You're not trying to actively change the the nature, the wholesomeness, the unwholesomeness. You're just noticing it, and then it goes. Oh, and it's and it's come back, and oh, it's still unpleasant, and then it then it goes, and oh, it comes back, and it's still unpleasant, or. You know, okay, you're not so actively trying to change anything. I know it, it's just the comparison of the two. You know, from being taught MBSR, from you know my first learning, it's just a stark difference. So it's just sort of struck me a bit. You okay. know. Well, now here's here's some possibilities. One is is that, like you said, they can get stuck in that and stay stuck in it for a long time. 20, yeah. 30, 40, 50 years. <laughs> I hope years. not. <laughs> <laughs> okay. The second possibility is by noting well and seeing dukkha as dukkha immediately, mm-hmm. you can begin to, the student can begin to own his own, begin to figure out what the Buddha was on about, that these, are, these thoughts are unwholesome. Let me change them into wholesome thoughts. And then slowly, slowly over time, like 10 or 15 years, he can come out of it. Hmm. But it would have been better to have warned him in the first place. Okay? Yes. (laughs) But then there's the other possibility. And that is, is for the noter who is a really, really good meditator. And he can meditate himself up and meditate himself down and meditate himself around the corner and meditate himself right into being able to sit right in the very middle of his own garbage pit, Mm. the whole city dump that he's created his whole life. And there he sits, sorting that stuff out. There's a bottle of dukkha. There's a newspaper of dukkha. There's a plastic jar of dukkha. There's an old hamburger of dukkha. And he's just got dukkha, and he's sorting it out all over the place. And he finally wakes up and recognizes, wait a minute, I am covered in dukkha. I am (laughs) full of shit already. (laughs) And that's when he becomes quite fearful of the mess he's made into. He becomes uh, in a great state of misery. Mm. He becomes completely disgusted. He then gets on a great desire to escape out of that. And that's when he wakes up to the point that I can get out of this. Mm. (laughs) But this guy may spend 10 or 15 years in in hell or in the garbage pit that this is what the Mahasi method calls the dark night of the soul. In fact, I intentionally listed on that direction of fear, misery, disgust, desire to get out of this, and finally the intention that I can get out. Yeah. Why spend 15 years in in that before we finally say that the, the correct practice is something that can be done from the very start? Mm. By understanding the nature of what is, in fact, a hindrance, what is uh, wholesome and not wholesome, and that, in fact, the removal of the hindrances and replacing it with wholesome thoughts is the first job that can be done and it's the most important skill that we have is the foundation for the rest of our practice which is now going to be doing nothing but investigating very wholesome things Mm -hmm. that exist like our energy level and our ability to investigate 
and all of the John of factors. How's my pity? How's my bliss? How's my, you know, how's my consciousness? Mm. Is my mind organized? And so these are the things that are worth noting are the things that actually are there. How's my equanimity? How's my rest? How's my joy? And these mm. are the things to be noted because those are the things that can be noted because those are the factors that we have in jhana. Mm. Yeah, 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 yeah. Okay, so now we have something worth worth looking into. Once we get the mind all straightened out, some people would say, well, uh, now that I'm all dressed up for the party, where do I go? <laughs> <laughs> now that we got this first John of Vehicle, where, what kind of uh, uh, racetrack do we take it out on? <laughs> and the answer to that is the wholesome qualities of the Eightfold Noble Path that in this level would then be the seven factors of enlightenment. Mm. In the sense of this is sati, rather than skati as a skill to be developed, now we speak of it as this is sati. Mm. This mm. is it. Okay, and the other uh, parts. This is investigation. This is it. Uh, uh, that our right effort becomes energetic in the sense of, yep, this is it. Mm. Mm -hmm. And then our pity is also at that level of, yep, this is it. And our sukha is at that level. Yep, this is it. And so uh, we go through those items, checking them off one at a time, including in Paticca Samapada, we visit, this is feeling. Yep, that's it. <laughs> this is perception. Yep, that's it. I can see it. Mm. Uh, this is consciousness. And so we actually begin to look at all of these various parts of the mind, the feelings. This is the body. Yep, that's it. I can see it. <laughs> I know it's there. <laughs> and so uh, we, in this first jhana state, we begin to visit all of these various qualities that are, in fact, qualities. Mm -hmm. And we're not noting unwholesome things because the mind is devoid of unwholesome things. And so we're going from one wholesome to another wholesome to another wholesome. Now, as the mind progresses in its quietness and stillness, that list that we just gave, actually has things begin to move off of the list. For instance, the wholesome thoughts, one after another, begin to have gaps in them. So that now we can get into the place to where there's no thinking about it, there's just the experience of the joy. Mm. And then we see how not only is this blissful, is it joyful, is it euphoric, but that takes a bit of effort too. <laughs> And settle down with this euphoric and just get into a state of, um, of being completely satisfied with experience. Mm. And then we start letting go of the experience until we got basically nothing left but the satisfaction, mm. the sukha, the equanimity. Equanimity, yeah. Mm -hmm. A very powerful experience, yeah. Mm. And so this is how we practice, but we practice by getting the first jhana first, mm -hmm. by giving only some thoughts, and then we start investigating the jhana factors and Paticca Samapada and the seven factors of enlightenment, the Sambo jhana, which is also the same thing as the uh, Eightfold Noble Path, especially uh, uh, investigating that thing called unification of mind. Mm. Did I put this clock back together right or what? <laughs> <laughs> Does it tick or what? <laughs> and so we begin to see that, yeah, the mind is actually functioning correctly. This mm -hmm. is really nice to see that the mind is actually in fine-tuned shape. Yeah. Got no sand in the gears. Mm. Mm -hmm. Got a good cleaning out. So cleaning one's clock is a good analogy. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, that's a very good analogy. Make sure it's all ticking at the right pace, it's on the right time, all the gears work, they're nice and shiny, mm -hmm. uh, it's all put together correctly. And it's all functioning correctly. Every part's yeah. in place and every part's in gear and everything is spot on. And that's what the path is all about is complete satisfaction with the way things are. But we have to set things straight 
first. <clears throat> yeah. Before you can have satisfaction, the other factors need to be set up correctly. Mm-hmm. And surprisingly enough, we use satisfaction for the scaffolding anyway for building those other skills too. Mm. Getting ourselves into a state of satisfaction. That's why all of this stuff runs in circles around one another, that they affect each other. It's almost like in uh, global warming, they have what is called a tipping point, and that is when enough ice is melted off of the tundra, then the dark tundra absorbs even more light very quickly and then things really get going or like the, the, uh, the ocean water is dark and absorbs light but if you've got it covered with ice then it reflects out and everything is good but when that ice melts now the ocean is dark and that makes things a whole lot worse in a hurry but in our case we're operating in the positive feedback system so that mm. everything works to the best yeah, but these things run in circle with each other and build up and build the skills, allowing us to see, hey, there's an end to this. We can we can do this. This is a possible path. Mm. Mm. Yeah. 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 <sighs> it all makes a yeah yeah. All makes that all makes a lot a lot of sense. Uh, yeah, everything fits together. Every crazy that crazy how it all fits together <laughs> like right. that. Yeah, it's known that way. In fact, from the time of the Buddha, and I learned this actually directly from Achan Po when he says from the suttas that the Dhamma is like a spotless piece of cloth, with all the woof and the weave done correctly, with no rips, tears, mm -hmm. torns. Uh, uh, spots, no stains. Uh, no stains, nothing. That it is just spotless, it's immaculate, it just everything fits together and it does the job. It's actually <laughs> liberating, it does the job it's designed to do mm. and it's free of charge. Oh, oh. <laughs> perfect. <laughs> <laughs> And it's absolutely free of charge to be giving joyfully. That in fact it's best given joyfully. Mm. Yeah. yeah. Yeah, yeah, That if anything, that is actually they talk about it in the sense of lineage or in the sense of transmission from the teacher to the student, and they don't quite understand what that is, but there mm. really is something. And that transmission is the um, to see one of that attitude, to see someone that has confidence, to see the spark, the joy, yeah. to recognize that that's possible. If one guy can sit there and laugh his way through an hour, I can too. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I mean, yeah, seeing real life cases and examples of it, mm -hmm. definitely helpful. You know, better than a book because that the books don't show that. Yeah, yeah, the books That's don't show that. Yeah, they just talk and through this... techniques and uh, theories and stuff like that. But to actually see a real life example and to hear somebody else's accounts and everything like that, you know, it comes back to confidence as well. You know, it's uh -huh. important to have exactly. confidence and determination in it. And if you can see That's it in perfect. somebody else, then. Yeah. It that's really confidence. helps instill spark. confidence. Yeah, 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 yeah. That's the spark. That's the spark. It really helps the student to see, hey, they can do it. Why can't I? Yeah. You know, they're exactly. doing this, that, and the other. Can. I can do it can. too. Do exactly. Yeah. So let's finish this off now with the third layer of doubt. Mm. The third layer of doubt. In fact, I almost gave away at one point was because the third layer of doubt is now that we've practiced the path enough and we begin to see that deeply because you can see the uh, the idea that I can see uh, the hindrances and pull them out of the mind is only the beginning. Once we are in first jhana, which would be the step two, mm. 
-hmm. then we can begin to see these wholesome things that the Buddha was talking about. And we begin to see that, hey, this path of the Buddha works. I can see to the end of this. In fact, mm -hmm. you could almost think of it as there is a light at the end of the tunnel, light and it's not tunnel. a train. <laughs> 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 there really is a light at the end of the tunnel. I can see my way through it. Mm -hmm. And that's where that real confidence comes from, the confidence that all I have to do is get to the other side of this tunnel that I'm in. Mm -hmm. But guess what? We could do that in immediate. All I have to do is clean that thought out. Yeah. And we do that over and over and over again until we recognize that, okay, there's a, this, is, um, this process that we're going through is, in fact, liberating itself. And so now we're talking about faith not only in can I do it, but I've got the tools. This is mm -hmm. it. This is the right stuff. Now we've got all we need. Mm -hmm. The doubt is eradicated. I know what the path is. I've got it. That's when the real confidence sets in. This is the real confidence of the soda pond. Mm. Okay. I've got it. I've got the Dhamma. I know the Dhamma. I practice it backwards and forwards and upwards and down and every time it works. <laughs> 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 and and so that's that now the, the third level of confidence is the confidence of uh oh like being able to play a piano concerto flawlessly in public for the first time. Right. A new, right. A new level of confidence. Now yeah, yeah. we've got really, really strong, strong right attitude. Mm -hmm. of, hey, I've got this now. This is almost the feeling actually of being on top of the world. But in fact, we think about it in the sense, and I like this, a student told me this, he says that everyone is there as an emperor. Every one of us is an emperor of our own pile of dirt. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, and, very true, very true. And immediately the thought comes to mind is, yeah, and who's buried under their pile of dirt? Who's struggling to get out of it? And how many of us are sitting on our pile of dirt? Just up there on top of the world. I imagine there's a lot of people who are buried under their pile of dirt. Mm -hmm. And they're uh, like, help they me, need... help me, I can't get out. <laughs> they don't know that they're an emperor and they don't know that they can rise to the top. Mm. They don't know, they don't have the path and they don't have the confidence of being able to walk that path. And so they're stuck at that first level of doubt of who yeah. can I get me to help me out of my own pile of dirt. <laughs> It's your pile of dirt. You own it. <laughs> and the thing of it is, is it's not really a pile of dirt at all. It's only because it's old, dirty stuff that's from the past. That, yeah. in fact, you can walk right away from that pile of dirt. Who needs to be an emperor of that pile of dirt? <laughs> you can go be emperor of something much, much more wholesome, much more right. pleasant. Exactly. That's another way of looking at it. But the first part is to be, uh, the analogy is getting on top of it all. Yeah, yeah. Like this, as opposed to like this. This is not really on top of it all. This is on top of it all. And so we do that moment by moment by moment by moment until we build up that habit. And pretty soon, being on top of the world is your natural point of view. Because mm -hmm. we can change it. You're mm -hmm. not. Who you thought you were. That's very true. Mm -hmm. So we have thoroughly discussed and discovered the three layers of doubt. <laughs> yes, very thoroughly. <laughs> and we can see also why the Buddha would put that as a fetter. Mm. We have to get rid of those doubts. But what's the end of the doubt is not just, oh, curiosity, or maybe I don't have to worry about it. No, the end of that, this kind of doubt is solid confidence. I've got that nailed. Confidence, I've got it determination. Confidence and determination that spark, this originally sparks from the whole ability to grasp the object. Yeah. That this is an active skin in the game practice. This yeah. is not passive. Passive is for victims. Active is for the champions. 
Yeah. Got to get out in that game and play. What game? <laughs> the game. <laughs> the thing that I like to say it this way is you've got a brand new toy to play with. Yeah. Your own human body to play with, with all of this it's idiosyncrasies and, and widgets and everything. And what a marvelous toy that is to play with. Yeah. It's important to view it as a toy, something to play with, a game. It becomes mm-hmm. playful. And when it becomes playful, it becomes fun. And when something is fun, you know, you're a lot more willing to do it, to do it better, to do it regularly. And then eventually it will become autonomous, automatic, and yeah. Yeah. You can see that process. Excellent. Yeah. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Well, Ben, this has been a really delightful talk. Do you have any questions about what we talked about? No, today? no, no. It's it's all it's all been very, very, very clear. Very, very, very clear. And yes, it's been a very, very delightful conversation today. I I do enjoy our chats. They are <laughs> they are very, very good. <laughs> well, I enjoy your humor also. It's oh, great. Thank I really you. like thank I you. really like our, our, our students when they uh uh Many of them, especially at the beginning, they're <laughs> for an hour. <laughs> for an hour, just uh, 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 uh. But no, no, no. It's important to, you know, take part in the conversation. It's a conversation. It's a two-way street. It's not. Yeah, put some skin in the game. <laughs> exactly. Exactly. Yeah. 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 We're having a conversation. I'm not just here to, to listen and to whatnot. It's engaging. You know. Excellent, excellent. All right. Well, we'll see you next time. This yes, is yes. Th- we'll see you again soon. Yes, yes, yes. Speak to you again soon. Take care. Okay, bye-bye. Bye. <laughs> <laughs>